I'm in the iPod. I want to get home. I push the home button right here, and I'm home. Back in the iPod. I'm back in the iPod. Now, here I am. You see five buttons across the bottom. Playlists, artists, songs, videos, and more. I'm an artist right now. Well, how do I scroll through my list of artists? How do I do this? I just take my finger, and I scroll. That's it. Isn't that cool? A little rubber banding up when I run off the edge. And if I want to pick somebody, let's say I want to pick the Beatles, I just tap them. And here's the Beatles songs with their albums right here. I want to play Sgt. Pepper's, I just hit Sgt. Pepper's right there. And uh, you know, a little help from my friends. Look at this gorgeous album artwork here. Of course, I got a volume control.
All right, well, I guess that's the countdown right there. Good morning. We have, uh, we're blessed to have with us these next four weeks, uh, Mark Hodges, who many of you know. Uh, he's a former member here at Levy, and uh, he's coming back. Well, just for these four weeks. Now, actually, Mark has recently, uh, he's recently taken on, on the uh, role in the eldership there at Pleasant Valley. And um, I've got a, a good man, a brother-in-law, uh, Eddie Shields, that goes over there as well, that's undertaking that. And we're praying for you guys and for the church over there. And, and uh, we're really happy that you're here. Uh, and Mark's going to be talking to us this morning about technology. And originally, when we first planned this class, uh, we had planned it for a different location. But uh, as I got to look at his material, I thought this would be something that's good for uh, all of us of all ages to, to go ahead and take a look at, whether you've got technology in your own home or whether you have family members or grandkids or kids that use it. Uh, he'll have some things to say to all of us there. And uh, just before he gets up, or maybe while he's speaking here, I'm going to go ahead and pass out our envelopes. Every first uh, Sunday of the month, we go ahead and take up a collection for our food pantry. And um, if it ends up with you, just if after class, if you want to bring that back here and lay this on the front row or hand it to me, that'd be great. So, Martin, we're glad you're here. Wow, this is fun. Look, I'm, I'm, I've traveled back in time, and that's a good thing. So, uh, and I got to get this because I'm a little older now and got to keep my throat a little moist. So, how's everyone doing? Oh, you sound thrilled sick to be here. So um, it, it is nice for me to be here. I'm going to go ahead and start by telling you I've got to, you need to indulge me for a second. I, I have to do this. I hope you understand I have to do this. Um, I need to thank you uh, on a lot of fronts. So I'm, I'm seeing a lot of faces that, uh, that I've grown up knowing and loving. And uh, by the way, churches are the same everywhere. All, all auditorium classes have a demilitarized mandatory six pew zone up here. So um, it's good. You're not going to get powder burns. Uh, I'll, I'll try and keep it simple. Uh, but let me thank you because uh, I have learned over most of my life, um, you know, approaching now five decades, although three of them probably really coherent, um, I have learned that God does an amazing thing weaving together a tapestry of people and events in your life that make you who you are, and uh, you play such a big part in who I am and who I've become, and so I want to thank you. Um, I, I, everything that I am, everything that I've been able to enjoy and, uh, and come to understand, you have played a part in, um, all the way back from, I'm sorry, you know, I know it's a sanctuasium now, but that will forever be the old auditorium to me back behind us, uh, but, you know, all the way back from those days when many of you who knew me as a younger kid, uh, as just a, I should say, a younger annoying kid, for those of you who did know me back then, um, it, it is just nice. It's nice to have a community of faith that goes beyond just one congregation, and so thank you. Um, I, I truly appreciate that uh, from my heart. Now, before I start crying, uh, let's go ahead and get started, um, and we're, we're going to Chad, am I okay? Do I need to move forward, back, or, or dance, or... Okay, all right, so uh, what I'm going to do is I, I've got to lay a bit of a framework. So when James, first of all, James um, snuck in on me, um, he offered to take me to lunch, and he took me to eat some uh, wonderful Mexican food. Uh, so I don't know who told him, but I have three mantras about food. One is uh, any meal you don't eat Mexican is a meal you never get back, um, so that's, that's one. Um, second one is food is just a vehicle for sauce. Um, that's just kind of one of the rules I live by. And the third, which doesn't really apply here, is when offered the chocolate souffle, one always says yes. Uh, so I found my life is better when I live by all three of those things. But James took me to get some Mexican food, so I was just pretty much nodding my head whatever, whatever he was asking. Um, so that kind of led us here. And I, I, over the past week, as I was kind of meandering through and figuring out, okay, how exactly am I going to do this? It hit me. I thought, you know, I'm not entirely sure if I'm going to hit the mark on any of this. So just bear with me, all right? Because what I'm going to do is I want to have a conversation about technology on one side, although I get a little nervous because I tend to get typecast as the tech guy, and that's really not what I intend to be. Um, I started out in television, did uh, cable. I was in youth ministry, obviously, here for a few years. Uh, I've been in data for many, many years, and uh, really, I consider myself to be more of the, 
um, the marketing and uh, really the marketing and the culture guy uh, more than anything. And so what I'm going to do is I've got to set a framework because a lot of parents Typically, when I go to places, they want to talk about social media. That's one of the big rages that everyone wants to talk about. Okay, great. We're going to talk about that next week. That's a bit of a bipolar conversation because you have two camps anytime you talk about social media. You have the people who say, yeah, we need to talk about social media. And then you have the camp that says, hey, yeah, we need to talk about social media. I mean, it's, it's that big a divide using the same word. So to frame that up, And to talk about what we're going to talk about over the course of this month, I need to set a groundwork. I need to get us all on the same page. And I'm going to be honest with you. Some of this is going to hurt. Um, Some of this will will, um, probably speed a little faster than you want, and and I'll apologize up front. But we're just going to dive in, so keep your hands and arms in the car at all times, and let's go. Um, Think back to 1977, for those of you who can, I being one of them. Uh, what was the number one rated television show in 1977? Anyone have a guess? MASH, we've got MASH as a guess. That's a great guess. It's wrong. But, but 1976, MASH was number one. I heard over here, somebody gave me the answer. Happy Days, absolutely. Happy Days was the number one rated show in 1977. Now, you need to understand what went on in the Hodges household in 1977. Okay? There were certain shows that I could watch, and there were a lot that I couldn't, and there were many more that I didn't want to, okay? Um, This was a time when there were three networks, as you know, I still say three. There were technically four, but after 9 a.m. when Sesame Street went off, PBS was dead to me, okay? Uh, But there were three networks, and in the Hodges household, I experienced a lot of the, I don't know how to say this other than the Mama don't allow none of that on this train kind of viewership, okay? Um, I could watch Happy Days, but I better not be caught dead watching Maud or something like that. Were you there? Uh, some of you were there with me, right? And some of you were like, well, I don't know. I kind of like Maud. That, that opening song went a long time, by the way. Happy Days, the number one rated television show with a 31.5 rating. Now, let's sidebar here for a second and talk about what exactly is a rating, a television rating, because you've heard this most of your life. Television ratings are done two ways. I'll do this in 30 seconds. With a rating and a share, a rating point, every August, Nielsen figures out how many households have televisions. And they figure out, and that a rating point is 1% of the of the U.S. households that have a television set. Got it? Makes sense? And then there's this other thing called a share, which is how many of the televisions that were on at that time were actually tuned to that program. So you'll see television ratings displayed like 10.2 slash 22. 10.2 rating, a 22% share. Got it? Everyone with me? Okay. If you didn't get that, Tommy Williams will explain it to you right after we're done. So 31.5 rating in 1977, it was monstrous. It was great. It was the year before Laverne and Shirley came out. It was the year before Laverne and Shirley debuted at number one, which I think to this day may have been the only show to ever do so. All right? Now, let's fast forward. Last year. What was the number one rated television show last year? Just throw it right out there. Um, Huh? NCIS? Very close. NCIS New Orleans was almost number one, but it wasn't last year. This show edged it out. Game of Thrones, close, and and I won't admit to that guilty pleasure, but for those of you who might watch Game of Thrones, no, it was not. Friends? No? Let let me give you a hint. Big Bang Theory. Anyone watch that show? Okay, a few people watch that show. Um, I am Sheldon, by the way, for those of you who do watch that show. Big Bang Theory was the number one rated television show in 2015 with a 7.1 rating. Now, let's be real honest. In 1977, if you got a 7.1 rating, you were canceled. Today, you're number one. What happened? What do you think happened that caused this dramatic shift? Well, it's fairly simple to figure out in this case. 
you've got a lot more choices. There's this little word called fragmentation that has occurred in television viewership. So remember I said we had three networks that mattered back in 1977. Today, the average household has 223 networks, channels coming into their house. 223. And you watch maybe two of them, right? I mean, I, when I worked with Comcast, I can't tell you how many calls I got saying, well, I, I just, I need my bill cut because I don't watch all, this, all these channels. So I, being, you know, a little bit feisty, would say, well, tell you what, the day that the Democrat Gazette starts paying you back for the sections you don't read, we'll talk. Because let's face it, you're paying for words you don't read with every publication you buy. So there's a lot that has changed, but it's not just that. Let me show you an example of something, and don't, don't get mad at me. Don't judge me, okay? I've shown this literally from here out to Los Angeles, California, okay? Just watch it because this, it doesn't just stop at television. Let me show you an example of something that's going on right now. Hey, how's it going? Let me show you something cool. Let me just pee a little. Ah, oh, yeah, nice one. <laughs> and now, without even having to cry, mommy's gonna come in my room to change me. Ta-da! You know how I did that? I'm using Huggies Tweet Pee, the diaper that warns parents when it's time for a diaper change. Its sensor detects humidity inside the diaper and sends a tweet to my parents, wherever they are. Through an app, of course, because, you know, that's how we roll in my generation. Mommy and Daddy know when I pee, when it's time to change the diaper, and even how many diapers I'm going to need over the following days. They can be bought and received at home with a simple click of a button. And because it prevents unnecessary changes, Mommy gets to save some money and buy me more toys. <laughs> yeah. Tweet Pee, helping Mommy organize, monitor, and buy diapers online. I, I can't make this up. I, I really can't. How, how many of you believe that's real? I'm just curious. Oh, a few. How many of you don't believe this is real? Okay, um, real quick, how many of you aren't going to raise your hand no matter what question I ask? Okay, that's what I thought. So, here's the reality of this. That product is in test marketing in Brazil today. Now, I know what some of you are thinking because I've thought it. Well, back when I had kids, we didn't need any sensor on the diaper. That isn't right. You know, I mean, this is pretty much how I dealt with my kids with their diapers. Well, it could sag a little bit more, so I think we can get a couple more hours out of that thing. I mean, I've, I've done that, okay? Tamara was a little, bit more, uh, a little bit more caring and feeling. I tended to be the guy who said, well, when it hits your knees, we'll, we'll talk. Come on back in here. There is a dramatic thing that's going on right now in society, and there are two words I want you to get in your head. One is linear. The other is exponential. Get those two words in your head, because I'm going to camp on those for a while as we go through that this morning. And I want to just ask you the question, what does exponential feel like? And to illustrate that, I want, to th I want you to think about if I ask you to do something, if I say, hey, I want you to take 30 linear steps, how far would you go? Well, sorry? 30 yeah, you'd go 30 steps. So how... Uh, generally, one person's stride, on average, is about a meter or so. Uh, mine's a little less. Um, some people are a little more. So that's where we get this average of about a meter per step, okay, for the average adult. So if I said take 30 linear steps, you would go about 30 meters. Everybody with me? This is simple math, okay? I'm, I'm gonna, this is the kind of math I can do. I can't do the kind of math I was joking with Tommy, and I'm sorry I didn't even give you an update. Let me just answer the question that I know I'm going to be asked, because this is usually how it gets asked of me. Hey, it's great to see you. Is Tamara here? That's pretty much what my life is like now. So um, I will go ahead and tell you she's not. She's got some other obligations over at PV, which is where I'll race off to right after this. But um, I'm totally comfortable being Mrs. Hodge's husband now, because that's pretty much the identity I have. So that being said, 
Um, you'd walk about 30 meters if I said, hey, take 30 linear steps, just go in a line. Now, if I said take 30 exponential steps, how far would you go? I'm going to be real impressed with the math whizzes in this room. If How much? Okay, you're, you're pretty close. You would go just over a billion meters. You'd walk around the earth 26 times. If I said take... Take 30 exponential steps. What does that mean? Well, exponential is basically meaning you build on everything. The first step is one meter. The next is two. The next is four. The next is eight. The next is 16. Then 32. Then 64. 128. Sounding a little bit like computer language, isn't it? Uh, computer memory. Exponential is you are building on every step that you take. And that is really a lot of what is going on in society today. So, let's talk real quickly about what does exponential look like economically and in society today. Think back to 1996. I'm asking you to go back in time a little bit this morning, but just bear with me. 1996, I had a two-year-old daughter. I, had, um, I was a year away from acquiring a son. Okay, that sounds like I'm bartering for him, but, um, you know, I, we were in that frame of life. And as parents, the biggest commodity we had to have on hand at all times was film, right? You never wanted to be found without having enough film. I can remember a time when I had forgotten the film on a Christmas. I was up in God's country, you know, up in Harrison, home of the Golden Goblins. And I was up there and um, I had to go to, I don't even know what it was. It, it was so sketchy. Um, I had to go to some kind of convenience store and pay like $92 for a roll of 24 exposure film. Uh, but we had to have it. Well, in 1996, that was kind of the height of things. If you went back to the one-hour photo in any given Walmart, you would see around the, around the counter just wrapped around big bins full of film. You remember this? And you could get, oh, it was a beautiful thing when they started selling the four packs. You buy three, you get one free or that's what they made us believe. Um, and you, you would get these amazing, huge packs of film, and we loved it because we didn't run out, and we always kept it. And in my house last week, I'm not kidding you, I found a, a roll of undeveloped film. I have no clue what's on it. Um, I'm almost scared to develop it. I don't even know where I'd go to get it developed at this point. Well, 1996, there was a company called Kodak. They had a market cap of $28 billion. They had 140,000 employees. Now, here's my example of going linear to exponential. Because what happened in Kodak's case is they ran in headlong into an exponential marketplace and didn't know what to do. And in 2012, they were bankrupt with 17,000 employees. Kodak is one of those companies virtually everyone in this room grew up knowing. You may have known them as Eastman Kodak for a while, for part of your life, but they were it. Now, in the same year, in 2012, there's this little company called Instagram that ends up with a market cap of $1 billion with 13 employees. Now, if you want to talk about exponential, that is exponential turning an entire industry on its head, and a company that had well over 100,000, nearly 150,000 people working for it, and now you've got these little companies that are just appearing, and they get billion-dollar market caps, and then turn around, and that was before they got bought by Facebook. All the owners, uh, all of the um, imagineers of Instagram are now all sitting around rich, and they started it out with 13 folks. And here's the amazing thing about it. They didn't sell film. They didn't sell cameras. They didn't sell anything that Kodak sold. They understood what Kodak forgot. Kodak spent a lot of time thinking, hey, we're in the film industry. They didn't realize they were in the imaging industry. Very, very different. And that allowed someone like Instagram to come up and just completely eviscerate them. Fast forward another year or so. I kept a copy of an article out of USA Today because I thought it was so telling about this example of going from linear to exponential. And that is this example from USA Today. On the same day, open, Twitter goes uh, out with its initial public offering and Blockbuster closes all of their stores. 
Now, I did some work with Blockbuster in a past life. They had, uh, they had a plan. They wanted to have a brick-and-mortar store within a 10-minute drive of every person in the United States. And for those of you who were around here, you know they came pretty close to doing it. I think it's now a T-Mobile store down here on McCain that used to be the blockbuster where I went. And it was the one where I and others would go in there, we'd race to the new releases section, hope that there was still one on the shelf, grab it, get home, pull it out, and then I would, in a holy fury, gripe about whatever the idiot was who didn't rewind the tape before I rented it, okay? I mean, you remember this. This is the stuff that we grew up and that we grew up dealing with. Well, this is a key example of how markets are adjusting to the exponential world. But there's more. Uh, just four years ago, almost five years ago, there was an article that came out that said in 10 years it's predicted 40% of the Fortune 500 companies will no longer exist. Now, you didn't grow up in that kind of pace. A lot of folks didn't. I mean, if you were in the Fortune 500, you kind of stayed there. But now, nearly half, and we're on a pace to do this, by the way. We're on a pace to actually achieve nearly half of the Fortune 500 turning over in the span of 10 years. The average lifespan of a company listed on the S&P 500 has decreased dramatically. Back in the 1920s, if you were listed in the S&P 500, you'd be around for about 67 years. That was the average. Today, you'll be around 15 years, and that's it. Business and economies are changing as a result of this. I get the, um, I, I guess I'll go ahead and give the attribution here. I get, we'll call it the privilege, okay? Sometimes it's a labor of love. I know, I'm walking out of frame, Chad. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll just stand right here. How's that? I'll stay rooted right here. Um, I have taught at Harding for 13 years now. One night a week. It's my labor of love. Um, and it's fun. I, I enjoy it. Teaching the College of Business. And I get to teach millennials. You hear this phrase, you know, the millennial generation. Well, they are everything that you've heard of them to be. Okay, we'll just say it like that. I found that there are two buckets of them. There's the bucket of millennials that I get in class who are um, way more concerned about their Spotify premium memberships and beard wax and um, you know, uh, making sure that the coffee that they drink at Starbucks has been grown by growers who have been properly remunerated by the nasty, evil, large companies in the U.S. Um, there's that camp. And then there's the other camp. There's not a lot in between, I have noticed, but there's the other camp. And that camp is the group of millennials that really, quite frankly, border on just being brilliant. Very smart very, they get what's going on in the world. They get what's going on in society. And they are the ones who have moved generations from saying, I've got an idea, to I run a billion-dollar company. Because that's what's happening with the generation that is coming up right now. They start companies like these, uh, little companies that you've heard of that end up being bought. And before you know it, I'm in rooms with people who are half my age, and they've already built sold and started another company. And I'm sitting there going, <laughs> you want to buy some data? I mean, that's, that's pretty much my shtick, okay? Um, it, it's, it's a little bit sobering to realize what is going on and how quickly it's going on. The effects that are driven by all of this are ultimately driven by technology. So let's talk for a second about the force behind this. Now, this may be an eye chart. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. I just want to start because this goes all the way back to 1900. When I go back and I look at what has happened in technology, we've got to start back there. And, and let me just, um, don't look at the screen. Bring your attention back down here. Let me give you the measure that we use. When we figure out computing power, we typically find something average. So we will say, for the average $1,000 laptop that any consumer can buy, how many calculations per second can that processor do? Does that make sense? That's pretty much the way we measure computing power, and we typically measure it by 10 to the X power. Well, you can see back in the electromechanical days with punch cards, 
we were at like 10 to the negative fourth power, okay? So we weren't going too fast. And then we move into the 40s with relays, the 50s with vacuum tubes, uh, the 70s with transistors, and then we get into this integrated circuit world, which really changes a lot of stuff, okay? Everybody kind of got the progression. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. This is what I want you to get. I've put together real quickly just a little bit of a logarithmic plot of looking at computing power. So we pick up from that point, um, really back in the 80s, the 90s, and we start looking at, okay, what happens now? So over on the left, the calculations per second per $1,000 for that laptop. Still got that. That's the measure that we're using. Well, if you look, 10 to the eighth power is about the number of calculations per second that occur in an insect's brain, all right? 10 to the 11th power for a mouse's brain, 10 to the 16th for you and me, although mine may be 10 to the 15th because I'm a little bit slow on the uptake sometimes. And then for the entirety of the human race, the snapshot of people who are alive today, it's 10 to the 26th power. Got it? Now, I told you, you were gonna, there was going to come a point today, um, and it's probably, let's see, 927. I'll give you five more minutes before some of you start thinking, isn't this supposed to be a Bible class? So just hang on for a second. Anyway, here's the interesting thing. In 2010, we achieved the calculations per second of a mouse's brain. In 2023, we should, when you buy a $1,000 laptop, it will have the same computing ability, the ability to do enough calculations per second of a human's brain. And by 2050, when you spend a thousand bucks on a laptop, guess what? It will be able to do the same number of calculations per second as the entirety of the human race at that time. This is happening exponentially, folks. And as much as we may want to slow it down, we aren't going to. As much as we may want to make this a little bit more comfortable for ourselves, it's not going to happen. So let me take a pause for a second because we've run through a lot of stuff. I want to share with you three things that are effects of this, three outputs of all of this that I've noticed. And all of them begin with the letter D. So, and that's not because I happen to make a lot of Ds in school, but just because it makes it easy. All right, so let me give you three things that are happening as a result of this exponential explosion that we've got going on in society. And the first one I will just call it dematerialization. Now, by way of a quick definition, I look at dematerialization as basically taking things that we used to need and just they evaporate, okay? The material is no longer needed. So here's an example. I was this guy. Years ago, I was this guy. Don Allen remembers me being this guy. Um, we would go to Best Buy and just walk the aisles and look at all the stuff that we needed. And trust me, it was a need, okay? I mean, look at this guy. Boom boxes, tape players, over-the-shoulder cameras, CD players, all of that. Word processors. And here's the amazing thing. 20 years later, all of these fit in your pocket in one device. Now, if you think about dematerialization, all of that material, you don't have to haul it around anymore because it's all compacted into one thing. And this is one of the challenges that media outlets are starting to face. Television networks, magazine publishers, newspaper publishers, they are now realizing that for the first time where you used to have to pay for a magazine subscription to get the magazine content and pay for a newspaper subscription to get the newspaper content and pay a cable subscription to get the video content. Now, all of those mediums are together on one platform. It's never happened before like that. So dematerialization to me is a very real effect of all of this. But the second one is demonetization. Now, in my mind, demonetization is the removal of money from traditional uh, economic outlets, okay? So let me give you a quick example of that. We're all familiar with these, right? Taxi fleets, bookstores, long distance. You remember when we paid for long distance, by the way? Uh, you remember back in the 90s where every telemarketing call was, hey, do you want a deal on long distance? You'll only pay two cents a minute or whatever it was, and we thought that was great, right? And, and for some reason, even when we got a deal on long distance, if we called from here to somewhere else in the state using what was called intralata service, we still paid an arm and a leg, 
It didn't compute for us. Well, bookstores, research libraries, classifieds, hotel chains. Well, what's happened to all of these? Oh, well, they're all being overwritten. They're all being completely replaced. And all of the traditional outlets are no longer usable anymore. You try and find some bookstores that aren't shutting down. Now, I know that there are plenty of you who will tell me, and I can almost mention your names, but I won't, who will tell me, well, I just like the feel of a book. I like to smell them pages when I turn them. Great, fantastic, enjoy that. I still read the Wall Street Journal in hard copy every day, okay? I get it. There's something about the smell of coffee and newsprint mixing together and wafting that just makes you a happier person in the morning. I get it. But it's changing, folks. And all of these traditional outlets no longer have a revenue stream. I go to the cities where the taxi cab drivers are blocking the entrance to the airport, keeping Uber out. It is hilarious to me. And, and as far as I'm concerned, go Uber. You know, I love disrupting economics. I love it. it, it because it finally starts to play directly to my interests. I'm a little bit selfish that way. From a taxi cab standpoint, from bookstores, I'm, I buy things off Amazon that I'm embarrassed about. How about you? I mean, I, I have a Tide dash button on my washing machine, and when I'm running out of Tide, I hit the button, and two days later, it shows up at my house. It is a beautiful time to be alive. Can I tell you that? It is absolutely a beautiful time to be alive. I love this stuff. The, the reality is that we are in a, in a world where things, especially technologies, are starting to be democratized, okay? Democratization is the next thing, that, the next D, and this is where we'll camp for a few minutes and then I will be done, okay? I promise. Democratization is, to, to me, it is... Um, tech and its effects that are spreading across societies. So here are some examples. Um, if you're familiar with Moore's Law, it basically stated for many, many years that computing power doubles uh, on average every 18 months, okay? That was basically Moore's Law. Intel is having trouble keeping that pace now, so they've now expanded it to 22 months, but regardless, it, it doubles very quickly. Well, here are some technologies that ride that, um, and I won't go into all of these, but they're happening today. Um, one of the things I'll point out, 3D printing. So Harrison, my son, who is, for those of you who are counting, 19 now, um, he is a freshman mechanical engineering uh, student at, don't judge, at Ole Miss, all right? So, so stop the judgments, but um, he is in his first semester, and he is having to do 3D printing of things he has designed in these CAD programs for manufacturing. I... I first saw a 3D printer two years ago. That was the first one I saw. And I did what most everybody who sees a 3D printer does. Wow, that's pretty cool. Let me get my phone and film that for a little bit. You know, I mean, we, I, I was just, it was just the cool factor for me. He's having to do it every day. These are things that are a result of this exponential growth in technology. And all of these things, and I'll, let's camp on number eight, artificial intelligence for a second. You've seen this before. This picture is from Jeopardy, when IBM's Watson played two guys, okay? The guy on the left is the guy who won the most money on Jeopardy ever. The guy on the right is the guy who won the most games on Jeopardy ever. And Watson eviscerated them. It was hilarious. And if you want to watch something funny, go out and look on YouTube. They've got some clips out there. It's worth it just to see Watson say, I'll take chicks, dig me for 500. I mean, because that was, in fact, one of the classifications that they had. So, did anyone see that by any chance? None, none of you. Some of you are Jeopardy. Okay, thank you. Thank you for being with me on this. So, it, it was hilarious. Now, there were times, you know, the humans would start beating them, but uh, Watson, for some reason, kind of righted himself. So after that publicity stunt, what happens to Watson? Well, let's look at what Watson was and is. Pretty serious computing power. I mean, when, anytime you've got 16 terabytes of RAM, okay, most of the computers you buy are not going to have that. Anytime you can process a million books per second, that's some pretty serious power. 
But after you go through Jeopardy, what do you do with Watson? It's kind of like the race car you built for a certain specific purpose, and now the race is over. Well, IBM actually had a good idea, and I'm not a huge fan of IBM, but be that as it may, they actually had a good idea. They said, hey, let's put Watson in the cloud. And so about a year and a half ago, they started feeding Watson every medical text and every medical journal known to man. And with Watson's AI coding and everything else that it had going for it, they now have connected Watson to the cloud, and Watson is providing medical backup for third world countries for first line responders in those countries. Basically, Watson is trying to play doctor virtually, and it's working. Now, is this going to put doctors out of business? No, because you can't replace someone like, you know, Tim Dowles or Don Allen Frost. But, you know, once uh, they could beat Watson in Jeopardy. But when you get down to a great use of technology, this is one of them. But let's look at some other things, because there's been a sensor explosion going on. This is a guy named Steve Sasson. He developed the first digital camera. It weighed almost four pounds, had a whopping .01 megapixel resolution, and cost $10,000. I didn't see any of you lining up for it. But here's the interesting thing about this guy, okay? And this is a side note. He worked for Kodak when he built this. And he brought it into the Kodak brass, and he showed it to him, and he was so excited. And this is real, okay? I'm not making this up. This isn't a preacher story. Isn't it sad that we use that as synonymous with lying? Um, it, it's, not, it's not a story like that. He walks it in, and he shows it to him, and their response was, how does it help us sell more film? And they made him put it in a basement. Kodak could have cornered today's market and they were short-sighted, and that's what happens with a lot of companies. Well, this guy builds that camera, and in the years that have passed since then, as of 2014, we have gotten a billion times better with all of this. The resolution is better, and now that camera in your phone as of 2014 costs $10. A greater than 10 megapixel camera you can have for 10 bucks when the original one in 1976 cost $10,000. But wait, there's more. Let's look at what early rocket navigation, in the internal measurement unit, you'll hear them in Apollo 13 talk about the IMU, you know, and when I went to space camp with my kids, which was awesome, um, and I would go again as an adult if I could. Um, it, it just, it fed my inner geek. Well, today, everything that that did, the cost was millions. It was built for the Apollo program. It weighed 50 pounds. Everything that that does, which is velocity and orientation and acceleration, is handled by two chips in your phone for a total cost of $4. Everything that that did. There's an explosion of sensors to the point where we're moving very quickly toward molecular computing, free and embedded machines. This is moving very, very quickly, folks. Now, as far as GPS, how would you like to have that on your dash? Because that was the first GPS receiver. 53 pounds, cost you a little over $119,000. Today, it costs a little less than five bucks to have that chip in your phone. This happens in everything that we do, and I'm telling you now, the next big thing is 3D printing, because it is truly disrupting a 10 trillion dollar manufacturing industry. Industries are going to fall as a result of this, and look at some of these examples. Everything in these pictures was 3D printed. The bottom left was a prosthetic that a child needed to play soccer, they 3D printed it. In the upper right, for third world countries, they, you know how we send people down to uh, mission points and we will build housing for those folks. They 3D printed houses for less than $5,000 each. In 24 hours, they printed 10 of them and then just went in and slapped the roof on. Musical instruments. Um, two years ago at the Consumer Electronics Show, uh, all of the hostesses, all of the hosts wore 3D printed clothing. And ladies, isn't it going to be great when you realize, I just don't have the right shoes for that. Go find them and print them. You talk about a great time to be alive. One of the most interesting ones to me is right there. That is in the Netherlands. That is a bridge they basically attached a 3D printer to, and it's printing the bridge across the canal. Now, I'm not going to be the first to sign up to walk on it, but let's be honest, this stuff is happening. Now, 
I'm going to take the foot off the accelerator. I've got five minutes. I'm going to take the foot off the accelerator and just ask. Let's bring it back to church. Let's br bring it back to Jesus' church, and let me just ask the question, what are we doing? All of this is going on around us. This is the society where you and I live every day. And what are we doing? I can't answer for Levy because I honestly don't know. But I just feel like the church as a whole, for the most part, is doing the same old linear stuff that we've been doing and happy with for a long time. And what happens is the world is racing around and swirling around us and running by us, and, and we're still plopping out the same things that we have for years. Uh, maybe not. Maybe not in your case. I hope not. But one of the things that frustrates me, and it has frustrated me for a long time, is this passage. If you remember Luke 16, and I'm just grabbing a little piece of it, let me just give you the frame up for this. This is a situation where Jesus tells a parable about a shrewd manager. You remember this, right? Hopefully. Basically, the story goes that this master comes in and he's going to fire one of his servants. So a servant gets this idea, hey, I'm going to go to all of the people who owe my master money and I'm going to cut him a deal so that when he fires me, one of them will take me on. You remember this? And so he goes and he says, hey, how much oil do you owe? And they throw out a number. He says, cut it in half. And so everybody's happy with him. And then the master comes back and he commends, look at the scripture, he commends the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of the light. So he says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Kind of referencing back to this, this uh, shrewd servant's idea of, hey, if I get fired, then somebody's going to accept me. But here's what troubles me. I wonder if we have taken our ability that God has given us to be shrewd and to operate pretty smartly and just kind of set it aside every now and then. And we watch all the stuff go on around us, and rather than going after the world, which we ought to be doing, we sit and watch it happen and then sit and celebrate how we aren't affected by that. Well, you are affected by that. So let me give you a few things just as we close. Our struggle is we've got to adjust our approach to an exponential world. Pure and simple. And when we talk about next week in particular social media and some of the things that we deal with there, we've got to adjust our approach. We've got to understand that this is, a, this is life at a different velocity than what many of us have been familiar with. The gospel does not need any changes. So let me just say this. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying, hey, let's go change the gospel. You know, people aren't all that comfortable with this baptism thing. So let's just, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying the gospel doesn't need any changes, which is why it's so awesome, because it doesn't matter what period of time Jesus' gospel is taught, it's going to be relevant. But there are different ways that we can share it, and I'll get to that here in just a second. And don't be fooled by the great omission. This is where I'll close. You know the great commission, right? We all know it. We could probably quote it. I quoted it for like a treat in VBS years and years and years ago. We all know it. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. And Jesus goes through all of this. Here's what's interesting to me. There is a great omission in this. Don't forget that this is the God of Leviticus. And he doesn't say how. Go and teach. He could have said, go and teach and use flannel graph. Go and teach and use tracts. Use those little color-coded open Bible studies that I learned with. You know, use all of those. He didn't say it. He left it blank. He left it blank everywhere that a lot of people wanted him to fill in the blanks, but he left it blank. And you know why? I'm convinced. He left it blank because he knew if we're going to relate to society in any point in time, we've got to understand how to speak their language. There's nothing about the gospel we need to change, but we've got to talk their language. And we've got to go where they are. And I'm just going to say this, and then I will be done. And Chad, you can just blank it, because I'm just going to stop there. I am tired. And this is just me, but I am tired. I'm sick and tired of feeling like we just aren't impacting the world. As a global church, I'm tired of it. 
And we can sit around and we can argue and we can say, oh, but we are. We're impacting the world. I look at, I look at the statistics, folks. I mean, we, our movement has, has been challenged, to say the least. And I think it is because I don't know how much fiery passion we have around the Great Commission to go out and speak the world's language and talk exponentially because if you want to know what an exponential person looks like, you look at Jesus. Jesus picked 12 guys to change the world. You show me something more exponential than that. There is nothing more exponential. He changed it and he changed it dramatically and we get the excitement of being able to go and share that message. So, in the coming weeks, we're going to talk a little bit more about that and about some of the interaction between tech and some of the things that you deal with and society as a whole. But for now, let's have a prayer, and then we will be done. God, I thank you for this place. I thank you for everyone in this room that has played such a huge part in my life. And Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the salvation we have. And Father... I personally thank you for letting each of us live at this point in time. So, Father, would you help each of us to feel the call to be your instruments in this day and in this age and help us to speak the language that will get the message of your Christ to this world. We praise you and we lift you up and we thank you most of all for him. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.